Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the fire station. We have a very fascinating event now. It's kind of unlike any that we've done before at Focus um, because it's the first time. I don't, I'm not sure if it's the first time we've had a French Caribbean writer at all, but it's the first time where, where I think we're going to be doing an event that's going to kind of happen in two languages. So most of this reading and conversation will be in English, but occasionally we're going to divert into French, which is going to be fun. And that's because the first of the writers we have here today is, I should apologize, my French accent is very, very bad. His name is Naomi Pierre Daomi. Close enough? Yeah. Yeah? <laughs> Sitting right there from, from Haiti. He's just flown in from Port-au-Prince yesterday. Um, he is the, the author of the novel, um, I'm going to show up, Repatrié, which is in English, Repatriated, Repatriated right. Uh, we'll hear a bit more about that novel, which is, which is set in Haiti and concerns a Haitian woman who was returned to Haiti under particular circumstances from the U.S. The second writer we have with us is Ayanna Gillian Loy, sitting right here, who I think is known to many in the audience. Ayanna's course, a Trinidadian writer, a, a past Bocas writer. She's been away for a while. She's been away for the past year and a half or so because she's been in the UK at the University of East Anglia, where she's currently in the middle of doing a PhD in creative writing. Um, she's also, I'm not sure if, if finished might be too strong a word, but she's very far advanced with her first novel, which is called The Gatekeepers. Um, and we're going to be hearing from a, a little bit of that novel, and she's going to be talking a bit about the work she's been doing and completing this, this book. Um, what both of these books have in common, apart from the fact that they're both set in the Caribbean, one in Haiti and one in a fictionalized version of Trinidad, is uh, they're both, uh, at the, you know, the heart of them, they're family stories. They're stories about family connections, family dilemmas, um, the kind of, you know, the, the chaos and the crises and the amazing things that happen within uh, small family dynamics. So we're going to hear from this wonderful novel in progress and this wonderful prize-winning novel in both French and English. And then Marie Abdullah, sitting at the far end, is very ably going to sort of co-chair this with me. And she's also going to provide, when necessary, some translation services. Everyone, I think most of you in the audience must know Marie. She is probably the, the person in Trinidad and Tobago who's done the most to spread French language and culture and appreciation of of Frenchness generally through her work with the Alliance Francaise and the French Embassy and many, many other projects over the years. Uh, she's also a great lover of literature and a great reader. And when I contacted her to tell her that Naomi was coming, uh, she immediately told me she'd already read the book in her French novel reading group a year and a half ago. So she was well ahead of the game. She knew about him long before the rest of us did. So we'll get this started now uh, by hearing from the two writers, but for now, please just give them both and Marie a round of applause, and we'll begin. And perhaps, perhaps we'll begin by hearing, it's always good to, to, you know, to know what the work is before we start to talk about it. So perhaps I will ask each writer to read a little bit, um, maybe just because Ayana is right next to me and also ladies first. Perhaps Ayana will read a bit of The Gatekeepers first, and then we'll hear some of Naomi's novel. So Ayana Lloyd. We always have this challenge with the height and the lectern and the mic. Okay, we're good. Sorted. Okay, hi. Um, so The Gatekeepers is set in a fictionalized version of Trinidad, as, um, as Nicholas said. And I'm going to read a bit from a little bit early on. Um, one of the major main characters, her name is Yajide. And um, she lives sort of on the outskirts of the city, which is called Port Angeles. Yejide curl up on her bed under the mosquito net, listening to the storm outside her window. It's three days since the wind set up and the first raindrops start to pound the roof. Three days since her mother, Petronella, lie down in her bed to die. When the storm starts, Yejide feel the small round of her belly rise and swell with a weight that feel like a hole. No other way to describe it, a hollowing, a dread slow emptying out. She hear about mothers in the village who lose their children to early unexpected death. They washing dishes, cleaning the house, or at work in the city, and the minute the child gone, no matter how far away, they feel a hole in that keening place. Feel it pull taut and empty out like the womb no the second the child leave the world. Yejide womb empty, and she have no dead children to mourn, but that is how it feel like, like something in her anticipate absence. 
she tell herself is not grief. Grief is a thing that come from love and love simple like breath. But what she feel for her mother was never simple. She don't know how to pack a big solid word like grief into the many boxes that exist in her heart for Petronella. In a deep red box, she placed her mother's disregard. In another, black like the beach sands on the west coast, the feel of her small hands quick to brush her daughter away. In a solid pink box, the fancy dresses that Yejide would sneak into her room and try on when her mother wasn't looking. In another, the smallest one, a deep blue, the knowledge that her mother did not belong to her at all, but to the dead, a winged thing that flew at night to places she don't know how to follow. She tossed and turned in the bed, sheets wrapped around her body like a shroud, and listened for a knock on the door. She thinks she hears footsteps on the landing, whispers on the stairs, someone stopping outside her bedroom door, listening, and then moving on again. Every creak of the floorboards, every shudder of the window pane asks the same question. Why her mother don't call for her? She can't die before she call her, but why it taking her so long? And what will happen if she don't call for her at all? Every time Ejede opened the door to look, hoping she had been sent for, the landing was empty. It was hard to know if she was asleep or awake, what was real and what wasn't. First day of the storm, she see her mother's twin sister, Geraldine, dead more than a year now, walk into the room wearing Petronella's clothes, a long green dress with lace at the collar, and a cup of tea in her hand. Ejede could almost smell the turmeric root and feel the heat of the steam rising from the cup. Geraldine put the tea on the bedside table, walked to the window, and stepped through the glass pane into the night air. Second day, she thought she wake up in a bamboo patch in the middle of the forest, no storm, no vigil, just cool breeze blowing sweet and green. Now, in the soft morning light of the third day, she remembered the last great storm many years ago that take Granny Catherine away. Yejide was only nine then, but she remembered like it was yesterday, like it was happening now. The rain had started after church on Sunday. The bubbles around her plaits too tight, and she hated the stiff white ribbons wrap around their ends. But the first few drops of rain mean freedom. Flecks of mud splatter her white dress. She pull off the too tight, shiny patent leather shoes, drag the knee-high socks off, and start to run up the hill for home, feeling the wet earth squish under her bare feet the tiny black wings of rain flies brush against her cheeks. She run up the drive out to the rain and tiptoe through the side door of the kitchen to find the house in uproar. A woman she don't know rushed past her from the laundry room with a pile of fresh sheets. Peter, who always pull her plaits and say, how the princess going today? Walk past her with his arms full of black sage bush, like if she invisible. Seema's mother, Laurence, was there too, with a whole set of people she never see before. The kettle screech in the kitchen. No one cared enough to turn it off. She couldn't find her granny Catherine anywhere. The storm reached full strength and daytime turned to night before Peter find her, still wearing her damp church dress, sitting in granny Catherine's chair. His eyes flicked from her to the living room door, down at his feet, and back to her face. How the princess going today? But the words sound wrong, like they hide in things. Peter loved Petronella for as long as Yejide could remember. He was not her father, but was as good as, and she never see him look nervous before. What happened, Peter? Where granny? Peter shift from one foot to the other, keep looking around to see if anyone else there, like he not sure if it was his place to say anything to her. The storm come for your granny. She go in. Going where? Where she must. Where mommy? Peter looked down at her with a half smile, like he recognized even then that she should have known better than to ask for Petronella. Your mother doing what she must too. She waiting for her mother to call for her. Granny going to call for me too? I want to see her. Peter shake his head. Only person Catherine called in is her daughter. He reached a hand out. Come, let's find somebody to get you out of these wet clothes. You're going to catch cold in this weather. Ejede untangled herself from the sheets on the bed, walk over to the window and curl up on the ledge. 
the rain come down in gray sheets, the wind snatch and snap branches, crashing them into the window panes. When you live in the hills close to the sky, where the clouds gather first and press down, you learn to read the rain. Granny used to tell her that they come from the storm, and the storm come from them. Make her think that every time it rained, it was because they had willed it. She would run out into the garden and raise her arms high, she and Seema dancing like the rain was a gift for them alone because they had been good, or because they had been especially bad and gotten away with it. It took years for her to realize that all storms was not the same, that some storms, like this one, bring death like a gift. Storm just so in the middle of the dry season, yellow and black kiskidies out in the rain and cackling at the wind, stray dogs in the village howling at the hills, and her mother, just so, like her mother, and her mother before her, grow still, watchful, and take to her bed. The newer villagers would worry about houses, livestock, and crops, but those who live in Mount Marie longest know the truth. In each house below, she saw there were elders gathered, candles being lit, and prayers being whispered for death to come to the house on the hill. She envied them. She don't know what to pray for. How to pray for your mother to die, even if she never studied her too much for one day in your whole life. And what it would mean to pray for her to live. She wonder if Petronella, lying in her deathbed down the corridor, feel that same weight in her belly, if she feel anything about her daughter at all. She push the resentment down and lock it away. Another box, this one slate gray. Thank you. Hello. Is there someone without Maria Abdullah who speaks in French here? No? Okay. For everyone else, it's a very good thing because there is no text more beautiful than a text you don't understand. <laughs> Then I'm going to read it in French. Billy Marchais. Vaillant et décidé sur ce sentier aussi simple qu'un calvaire. Le soir arrivait. Il portait avec lui une lune bien ronde et un air en mouvement qui jetait des bourrasques sur les quartiers amoncelés. On distinguait la route étroite en terre battue, traversant comme une lame deux rangées de toits délabrés, des tôles rouillées, du bois pourri, des clous béants et, de temps en temps, comme seule en générait la vie périurbaine sous les tropiques, une mare boueuse concoctant de nouvelles sortes de bactéries. On distinguait également, à plus petite échelle, la serviette dans les bras de Béli, la tête d'oreiller sur son épaule et le passé dans ses yeux. La serviette hébergeait sa dernière enfant, tandis que la suivait, hésitant, un jeune homme pâle et chétif, appelé cela un freluquet à peine pubère, triste et boutonneux, son fils aîné. Elle avait la sensation d'être spectatrice de sa propre errance, comme si chaque particule d'elle-même avait déjà vécu cette route, condamnée à la vivre toujours. Sans le secours de sa crampe dorsale, déflagration impitoyable qui frappait dans les moments cruciaux, Belly aurait pu croire cette errance irréelle. Maybe by PD you can continue in English for them. Thank you. I'm now going to uh, read to you a translation of what Naomi Pierre Daomé just read. You must admit that French is a beautiful language, and Naomi spoke so beautifully that even if you did not understand, I'm sure you enjoyed his reading. <laughs> uh, this is a little bit of a frustrating experience because today we have a special situation when we do not actually have any of the books of the writers. Uh, our friend Ayana, because it hasn't been published, and Naomi, Naomi's book has been published, but it has not been translated in English as yet. 
His book was a great success from the time it came out in 2017. Um, it was a big, big success in France, and uh, where it was published by Edition du Seuil, one of the major publishers in France. And uh, um, I have a, organized a French club, a reading club, where we read every month a book in French. And we decided, in view of the success of Naomi's book, the fact that it got a prize, a prize called Révélation, which is a book given by literati or people of letters, so it is a, a good prize. Then he was selected for the prize of francophonie, correct me if I am wrong, of writers who write in French. And in 2018, uh, after we read the book in our club in January 2018, he got actually the prize of the secondary school children. And this is quite an amazing prize, which has been in existence for a few years, quite a few years. And it gives the opportunity uh, to children in secondary schools to read books which are contemporary, which have just come out, but also to make a decision about them. And I think that's quite an achievement. So it was very good that he got this prize because I have been following it for all these years and I am always very impressed by the maturity and the very interesting judgments by these young people, by those teenagers. Um, you will have to wait uh, a few months, I think, before uh, the uh, book is published in English. But we just got off uh, the first chapter translated in English. And I'm going to read a little bit so that you know what it's all about, um, even a bit more. Belly walked bravely and decidedly on this path as simple as a test of faith. The night came, bringing with it a round moon and a moving breeze that sent gusts of wind through the stacked neighborhoods. The straight asphalted road could be seen cutting like a knife across two rows of dilapidated roofs, rusted corrugated tin, rotting wood, gaping sidewalks, and from time to time, a muddy pool that, like only suburban life in the tropics, could create, concocting all sorts of new bacteria. When looked at on a much smaller scale, there was also a towel in Belly's arms, a pillowcase over her shoulder, and the past in her eyes. The towel cradled her latest child while a pale and puny young man, call him a prepubescent whippersnapper, pimply and sad looking, hesitantly followed Belly. She felt like the spectator of her own wandering, as though every part of her being had already lived this journey, condemned to live it forever. Without presence of her back spasms, a merciless explosion of pain that struck at the most crucial times, Belly could have believed in his unreal departure. Now this is as far as Naomi read. I'm going to read a little bit more. She knew exactly where a back spasm could lead her, a full moon and a chosen fate. For 10 years ago, just as the past could be read in her eyes, she had only by the power of the absurd thrown a second boy into the high sea during a clandestine voyage. In autumn 1987, Belly had taken part in Brother Fanon's final departure towards the beautiful beaches of Florida. It was on a craftsman sailboat made of sewed timber, either cedar or elm, 12 meters long, that could hardly be called brand new. He loaded it 
all the same for this occasion with men, women, and children. Shovel loads of dreams and sacks of coal to not raise the suspicions of the Bahama, through which you had to pass laterally against winds and tides in this large corridor to the north of the archipelago. Brother Fanon, to be completely honest, was more of a piddly waterman than a great sea captain. He lived on weekly shipments from Port-au-Prince to the forgotten coast of Grand Anse. He transported humans and merchandise to and fro, unloaded large ships, and along the way, served tiny inexistent ports, following the vagary of the clientele and of clandestine dealings. This modest situation, far from being prejudicial, allowed him to venture step by step and according to need in coastal navigation throughout the Caribbean Sea. He knew the northern alleys almost as well as the eastern and western descents, all of the confusing longitudes, and he included in that the fruitful crossings of the Turks and Caicos to Nassau, and even further onto the Grand Bahama. He distinguished himself in having reached Floridian soil more than once, which he had populated with, in less difficult times, a couple dozen migrants. Thank you. OK, so we, we've heard a little bit of both novels. Um, Marie has uh, prepared some questions for Naomi. I have a few questions for, for Ayanna. And at some point, we hope these questions will start to cross over each other. So perhaps I'll let Marie start. What, what's the, I'll let you begin with, with Naomi. Before I ask any questions, can everybody hear me? Yes? Before I ask any questions from Naomi, I would like to also say, like Nicholas mentioned before, how proud and happy we are to have in the flesh uh, a real author from the region, uh, a real French-speaking author from the region. In the past, we have had a lot of uh, disappointments. And uh, yesterday, when I wasn't sure whether Naomi would have his visa to come to Trinidad and Tobago for the first time, I had palpitations. <laughs> but he's here, and we are very happy to have him and to welcome him to Trinidad and Tobago. Um, this uh, book is amazing. Uh, I'm not going to tell you the story, because that would be totally unfair, uh, but it is uh, an interesting factor that the book starts in 1987, from the first page which was read, and uh, it goes on to 2010, I believe, which is the year, more or less, uh, well, that is the year of the major earthquake. Um, so it is interesting also because these dates have a sort of uh, uh, link with your lifespan. So um, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Okay, I'm trying to, to respond in English, but if I stop, you, you can translate. What was the question? My memory, my memory English is very short, you know. You have to... Yeah, I, uh, I was born in. Uh, hmm? Yes. Alors, um, c'est trop intéressant pour répondre en anglais. Okay. <laughs> uh, c'est que un premier roman publié, en tout cas, a, 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 est souvent autobiographique. Mm -hmm. A first novel, uh, published, uh, uh, first published novel, is often autobiographical. Mais celui-là euh, n'est pas du tout directement autobiographique. Il ne vous a pas échappé que je ne suis pas une femme. 
Et je suis encore moins une mère. dictature Um, when when I wrote the novel, I didn't think about that, but it it um, was natural, like uh, simple for me to write with the, these two 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 times to to date, uh, if can I if I can say. Um, I didn't think about it, but it's co it comes like um, if I had something to say at this moment, it should be some uh, thing uh, nearby. The, the end of the dictature, because I didn't know dictature, dictature. Yeah. and the, the, the end of, the, of something. I don't know why it is. Mm -hmm. The earthquake is already the end of something. Yes, definitely. You can translate in French for, <laughs> for no one. <laughs> well, maybe I can ask Ayana a question that kind of follows up with that. I'm in, intrigued by what you said, that a uh, first novel is very often autobiographical, but yours isn't specially. Ayana, your first novel, which is in progress, to what extent is that autobiographical or not? I don't know to what extent something could not be autobiographical, even if it is not deliberately. Um, on the, the, the face of it, it's not at all. Um, the Gatekeepers um, follows two characters, one woman who is the heir to uh, matriarchy, where her family members have cared for the dead. They are spiritual guardians of the dead. Yep, not me <laughs> at all. Um, however, I have always felt that I was part of a matriarchy and part of a line of women, and my auntie is, is here. <laughs> um, so I suppose to some extent, I'm, I've always been sort of thinking along those lines of what we inherit, what we pass on, um, and what we the territory that we sort of live in as part of a family. Um, the other character, Darwin, is uh, a Rasta man who ends up becoming a grave digger, um, totally um, against anything that he thought that he would have been doing, um, very much not a part of his religious philosophy. And, and, and so he, found, he finds himself making one decision for survival and ends up going down this very, very slippery slope of abandoning many principles that he sort of held in his life, so the, as these two characters intersect, they're both dealing with inheritances, they're both dealing with the ways in which um, people are sometimes forced to make themselves, make their way in the world. Um, and that is, to some extent, autobiographical. I mean, I think we've all, whoever we are, we're all sort of making choices at every step in the way to figure out, you know, how much do we hold, how much do we let go, how much do we have to kind of make up as we go along, and so on. So. Um, Um, it didn't intend, at my first novel, I thought would have been quite autobiographical. And then this strange little story just kind of came up in my head and wouldn't let go, and it's going to end up being the first. And is there a particular significance to this the time span of it, the way that Naomi's novel, in a sense, brackets you know, the, the beginning of his life to the event that he calls the beginning and end of everything? What is the time span of The Gatekeepers, and what, um, does, the, it, does it have a particular significance? Um, it's, it's, it's contemporary, um, but at the same time... Um, so The Gatekeepers is set in Port Angeles, that is part of Spain, but not. So it's not quite time-bound. There are parts of 
um, the novel that I'm very, very concerned with a city that is a colonial city that is still in the throes of grappling with new independence, with which Port of Spain is not, but it, except it is in the way that independence is always new and you're always still kind of never quite finished going through that process of decolonization and going through that process of, okay, what are we now? Um, so I suppose to answer that question, um, the time span is, while it's now, it's always kind of reaching back to mm -hmm. as if independence had just happened. Mm -hmm. And um, I suppose to go back also to the, the question of whether autobiographical or not, in a lot of ways in my life, that sort of, I'm still kind of in that place of, of charting out on, on something quite new and figuring out what, what that life is, is, is supposed to be now. Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the novel, uh, Naomi, you have um, uh, touched so many different uh, subjects uh, and you have very successfully combined them all at the same time, having uh, a real story, you know, to uh, f take us throughout the book. Uh, very often, especially in French modern novels written by people from France mainland, you have a very intellectual, uh, you know, way uh, where really at times you are wondering, although it's usually well written and the language is beautiful, why did you buy this book? Or why are you reading this book? Or why have you recommend? And uh, I, I won't say what I really call it, uh, but I can say it because I think you're all adults here, but I call it intellectual masturbation. Uh, and I hope this doesn't shock you. Uh, right, now, uh, Naomi. Fortunately, I don't understand everything. <laughs> <laughs> but Naomi has written a book with a real strong story, and at the same time, he has involved uh, in a very balanced and very exciting way. Lots of the problems, lots of the questions, like the family, uh, what is a family nowadays? You know, how do you define a family, really? And what makes a family? You talk about immigration, you talk about adoption, you d talk about survival, <laughs> and uh, you talk about religion in a kind of a uh, you know, not straight. Uh, can you, you elaborate a bit on that? Well, uh, Marie, because um, in France, uh, when, when you present your book, uh, people um, ask questions, more journalists than just a lecture, ask questions, uh, consider it a few themes, thema? themes, themes, yes, a few themes, and they don't really consider it all of the themes. Um, the first theme is, yeah, there is a lot of misery in Haiti, right? Yeah. Uh, and the second is the earthquake. There is two, th the earthquake themes, okay, but there is a lot of themes that, that is imp th those, those are important for me too. Because why? Because I love stories. I, I really love stories, uh, all kind of stories like religious stories, if you say to me after dying you could go to paradise or to, or, or to hell, I understand and I, and I accept, I'm okay. If you say there is a 70 virgin that is waiting for you, I'm okay. It's a lot, it's a lot of virgin, but I'm okay. Um, I love stories. I love politics stories, even if the same as religious stories. You, 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 you really have to love stories to believe them. <laughs> but I love. Uh, then when I write, I don't have problem to put a lot of stories. C'est ce qu'on dit en français. On dit que c'est dense. C'est dense. So do you say? Thick with stories. Yeah, because of the writers, I love too. Uh, you, you should know should certainly about uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, mm. my favorite writer. He used to put a lot of stories on, on every story. Yeah. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And uh, I love Jose Saramago, you know, the, the Port Portuguese, Portuguese writer. Uh, and for me, stories, it's a kind of uh, 
exploratory breath. If you use to wide it with musicality. Then uh, my love for story and my love for poetry is the reason that I put a lot of story and a lot of them in the book. I hope, um, I hope you will read it. And I'm sure they will read it whenever they have access to it. But your style is also very special because you combine poetry. Uh, the story is not a, a light story or you know an easy story, really. I mean, it is very deep. But at the same time, you put a lot of poetry. You have a style which is amazing for a first novel that you have defined already such a strong style. Now, you say you are not uh, really a writer. You said in one of your interviews, you are a lecteur qui écrit, a reader who writes. I think more or less every writer has also to be or should be a reader. But I mean, it is amazing how you have managed to combine that strong style. Thank you. If I have uh, some seconds, mm -hmm. um, it's important to me to be a, a reader. Uh, but you know, uh, in Haiti, the the gender, the major gender, is not novel. It's poetry. Uh, when you are a good novelist. They call you a poet, and if you don't, if you don't, uh, if you don't write poetry, you just write some novel, uh, some novels not too good. Data, yeah, it's good, but but uh, I'm reading. But some you're no poet. Po okay. <laughs> it's not poet. See, it is uh, the, the the important thing. And I I used to write poetry too. Uh, I used to write poetry before uh, novels, and I still write poetry. Uh, it's a little bit sad because I have a great press for my novel, but a, a little, very little press for my press. Okay, <laughs> and for a nation, it's a, it's a great problem because I say maybe I'm not a good writer, then not a good poet. <laughs> um, uh, poetry is important because literature is important. Uh, somewhere, literature is a kind of poetry who forget himself but a kind of forage. I would like to ask um, Ayana a kind of a, a similar question. So we've, we've heard about um, Naomi's style, his voice, that sort of poetic voice. I mean, a basic question I'd like to ask you, which I think is something that um, very many um, Caribbean writers, certainly Anglophone Caribbean writers face, is the exact language to write in. Mm. Are we writing and are you writing the language that people speak in the streets, the language you speak at home, the language of books, the language of, of education, the language of alternate education, or a spectrum through the whole, th you know, do you c cover the whole spectrum in your prose? Um, so, isn't it with this book? Um, I am concerned with the vernacular. I'm concerned with how we speak every day. I'm concerned with the poetry of, of that. Um, I also can't escape my own voice as a person. So I think sometimes it sort of mediates. So for instance, in, in, in Darwin's um, sections of the book, um, far more Trinidadian dialect, far more Trinidadian Creole. It's much, much stronger in those parts. In Yejide's parts, it's a bit sort of, it's a bit sort of mixed. And um, I think that that's true to the way language operates in the Caribbean, operates in Trinidad. We're speaking in different register, registers all the time. Um, one of the things that I was very um, fortunate that's happened is that I haven't had, um, even though I'm, I've been writing this book outside of the Caribbean, I haven't had um, any sort of pushback as to make this standard English or make this sound like this or, or write it like this. It's been um, very accepting for me to sort of um, weave in and out of different Englishes, um, which is, is, I mean, not yet anyway. You know, by the time you get to publication plays, you know, phase, maybe that may be so, but um, I'm far more concerned with this is, this is my language, this is the way I speak, and um, these are where these, where these characters are from. Um, for me to write them any differently would just would be dishonest and wouldn't be, it just wouldn't be right, it wouldn't sound right to me, my air. So, yeah. I think um, 
I think we both, um, Marie and I both have more questions to ask, but I would, I'll just stop for a moment and see if there's anyone in the audience who would like to ask something of either or both writers. I want to make sure that you have a, an opportunity. If there are any audience questions, no hands up. All right, we can continue. I'll just, a, a quick follow-up to that, Ayana. I was thinking about what Naomi said about in Haiti, if you're a really good, if you're a really good writer, they call you a poet. I'm wondering in Trinidad, if you're a really good writer, does that make you a Calypsonian? What do you think? Oh, whoosh. <laughs> I mean, I, I think hope so. I think there's certainly a few of our novelists who have who have, have tried and, and su successfully to, to be Calypsonians in their novels. You know, um, Calypso has actually been. It's so funny that you mentioned that. Has been. Um, I think before I was reading books, I was listening to Calypso. My mother um, sang Calypsos to me as bedtime stories when I was little. So I think my first approach to story was actually song. Was actually Calypso first. So it was always the oral, it was always the musicality of language. It was the almost circular way that we sort of approach narrative, where you kind of start so and you're going so and you swing back and you're kind of thing to decide and you bring in another piece of story that wasn't there. And, um, so that's very much, I think, has influenced the way that I approach narrative and I approach story. Um, I had a very, very short-lived primary school calypso <laughs> time period that I think everybody's have to end up, you end up in some Calypso monarch in, in primary school kind of thing. But for me, I think that is the um, Calypso and I, I want to extend that Calypso, Rapso, folk stories, folk songs have really, is really the bedrock of how I think of narrative in Trinidad. I don't know. I find mm -hmm. you have another accent when you talk about Calypso. Um, <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> It's such a kind of sore spot for me, you know, because uh -oh. as, I'm, as I have not been here <laughs> in the last couple of years, I find people giving me a little thing about accents and if it does. And so I don't know how to feel about that question. <laughs> I don't know. I just, you know, I, because I don't speak English very well. Right, like, right. No, okay, you're like, you can't. Yeah, <laughs> but you have an, okay. But I have a demon. You know, I just buy um, a disc, a uh, vinyl. Uh, uh, yeah, old fashioned. If someone has like old fashioned vinyl of Calypso, <laughs> I give a book for 10. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. Please explain that. <laughs> But uh, uh, I don't personally have any left, but uh, <laughs> my, uh, my son, whose uh, father was a musician, has a collection of vinyls, so I put you in touch uh, Thank you. on that. Yes, <laughs> with the real old Calypsos. I learned uh, quite a lot about Trinidad, certainly about Trinidad history. Uh, through the Calypsos. took me a long time, like I will have to listen about 12 times before I could fully appreciate everything. But all the wit and the double entendre, and now I miss that tremendously because there doesn't seem to be as much of that wit. You, f you didn't say wit, W-I-T. And uh, I think the wit is in Naomi's book, that sort of wit which takes away the edge from very serious things, but not pushing you away from what is serious, you know? And that that's, is very important. That's something that I, um, not, not that I miss, but um, the, I think in my work, I, as much as I'm, I'm, I'm in a tradition that sort of has that subversive, and I say, when I say part of that tradition, I mean in Trinidad, Calypso, that kind of thing, I think, Personally, I, 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 I sit on that, on the, I don't subvert the edge. I want the edge, I want the sharp, I want the hard, I want the things that are hard to talk about. I want the ugliness as much as the beauty. Um, so I don't, th I, sometimes I wish that I were more of a witty writer. It's just not in my, it's just not my thing. It's, I don't have it. And so maybe I, maybe I, I, I Maybe it's something that one could learn and develop, but it's just not my, my territory, you know? Now, it's, it's always the case that when the hour seems to go by too fast, it's because the conversation was too enjoyable. The hour has gone by very fast, and we're gonna have to wrap up momentarily, because I'm gonna give you all a last chance, if there's anyone in the audience who, we have a question from Colin. So we do, we do have a couple of, so we'll take just those two hands that went up, and then we're gonna end, so Colin. I wanted to ask both writers questions, but in different ways. 
and that is about your plans to be editors. Um, one namely because you're a breakthrough writer and you have this opportunity um, to use that for other writers like you and Tiana because you know now you've crossed over to the realm of authority. <laughs> and Why do because, you not call it? <laughs> no, 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 because I know the work that you've done already as an editor and I want to know kind of I want to encourage you to do more of it. So I wanna kinda embarrass you publicly and ask you about your plans. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll, I'll answer and, and also make a plug for um, a, a, a magazine that is um, very, very close to my heart, that Richard Georges, who's also no um, stranger to Bocas, um, edits. And Colin and I have both worked on an issue of Moco magazine um, that sort of was in conversation between more established writers and new writers, and we edited that together. And Moco... Um, remains, I think, one of those um, publications that we sort of, every, every issue you think, oh gosh, is this gonna happen, is it gonna happen? And then we keep going and we keep going and it's been a real joy to encounter so many other writers in the region, new writers, established writers, who are just happy um, to be a part of a space that is devoted totally to Caribbean writing. So um, I have been, I'm a consulting editor on Moco Magazine. I'm always open to, um, to edit and to be a part of, of, of assisting with publications. I'm always slightly in that place of feeling like, I don't know if I have the chops always, but you know, you keep doing it and it turns out okay. And you say, okay, cool, you just, you just make your contribution. So that whole thing about crossing over into authority, I don't know about that, it's that you, <laughs> You, you make your contribution from where you are to help the work grow and to have more work, you know, keep, keep going and keep happening because, you know, without that, then what are we doing? You're just going to sit down and, and, and write and publish and be somewhere out there in the world by yourself? That don't make sense. You need, you know, that encouragement and just have, yeah. 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 Yeah you know, to get published. Yeah. And can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because ah ben, that's very interesting. Euh, C'est bien simple. J'ai envoyé le manuscrit quand je l'ai eu à au moins 20 éditeurs différents. Naomi sent his manuscript when it was ready to 20 different publishers. Avec des lettres de refus parfois typiques. With many letters rejecting his work. Et parfois des lettres de refus très violentes. And some of the letters refusing his work were okay, but others were extremely violent and unpleasant. Je me souviens même de, du cas d'un éditeur qui m'a dit que euh, votre person, vos personnages ne sont pas attachants, vos, votre histoire ne tient pas la route. He even got a letter from one publisher who said that his story uh, was not worthwhile and uh, the characters were not characters that people would like. Uh, and uh, I mean, remember these two statements when you read the book, and then come back to us next year. Et pour finir, quand j'ai été lire les auteurs qui sont les auteurs phares de cet éditeur, je me suis dit bon, tant mieux parce que ces auteurs ne sont pas attachants et ces livres ne sont ne tiennent pas la route. And then Amy looked at the authors who had been published by this particular person, and he discovered that in fact. Uh, He was okay to be rejected by this publisher because <laughs> what what that publisher was all publishing, names, neither the characters, neither the stories were that enticing. You, you asked for the name. All right, everyone, um, if we are uh, to have any hope of running on schedule for the rest of the afternoon, we are very sadly going to, I'm sorry, I know Funcho had a question to ask. I'm sorry, Funcho, but we are, we are really, really and truly, really and truly out of time. The time up sign is being flashed at me. So the first thing I want to say is please, a round of applause to thank Naomi, Mary, Ayana.
Naomi's novel will be available in English very soon, we hope, and I know you'll all be excited to read it. And Ayanna's novel will be also published in English very soon, we hope. We're looking forward to it. We said with Ayanna, now you are obliged to invite us both I was next year. No, I was, I was about to say, that was the next thing I was going to say, is we have to have you back when the two books are published. Now, the next event that's going to start in about two minutes, if we're very quick, um, is a conversation between Gary Young and Kevin Adonis Brown. Um, so please don't disappear from the fire station. It's going to take us just a minute to prep the stage, and then we'll get that, that event and started. And in 30 seconds, I just want to say that uh, Naomi has another book which is ready uh -huh. and which is going to be published. So next year, you will hopefully have two books. Both books. So another round of applause to the writers again, please.